Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be here with you today. And I just ask you for a little bit of patience because there's I see a lot of guys coming in. So let's give them just like one or two minutes to reconnect with us and we can start with the presentations and with the following Q&A session. Okay, I believe we are good to go. For the beginning, I would like you all to imagine a late December night. It's so cold that you feel tingling on your face and it's so dark that you can see the tip of your palm in front of you. You are laying down in the mud, underwater, 35, 40 meters deep, and you are waiting and waiting. You are getting nervous because you are having your equipment on your back. And this equipment is very heavy. It's like 100 kilos on your back, your equipment, cameras, sampling tools. And you still can see the tip of your palm. You are getting more and more nervous. It's the 10th day of your, of your diving activities and you are still waiting. And you are waiting for a shark. And you are not there to stay a thrill in these amazing animals, but you are there to help them and to try to better understand them. This understanding that is developed both through the extensive field approach and the labs are used to build the species-specific in-situ conservation measures, which help us to save the species that are currently on the brink of extinction. And as you will hear in a minute later, more than half of the species here in the Mediterranean where I work is currently threatened with extinction. And it is our fault, and it is our responsibility. And it's a proper time for us to take, take responsibility for it and do some action that will be effective in terms of long-term conservation. But before we started, let's see what the shark really is. So despite breathing on gills and living in the water, right? Sharks and other, let's say, conditionally fish doesn't have much in common. Firstly, the skeleton of shark is made of cartilage, which is calcified and the cartilage is similar to your ribs. Uh, furthermore, they have no ribs. And as you can see on my slide, this skeleton is pretty simple. Based on this simplicity, they are capable to do extremely fast swimming. Even the, for example, the mako shark, this is one of the fastest fish in the sea, that can do extremely fast accelerates because of, the, of their hydrodynamic shape and the, and the skeleton forms. Furthermore, they don't have the swing bladder. And they are far more similar to us than you can possibly imagine. For example, when we are observing the sharks under the microscopes, the parts of their organs, uh, for example, the thyroid gland, pancreas are quite similar to us. In some cases, you even couldn't find any notice, which say just another proof how much vertebrates are similar between each other and how much we also belong to the nature, despite we are trying to uh, move ourselves into the concrete buildings, uh, castles, cities, but actually the nature is the only home that we have here and sharks are part of it. If the sharks disappear from our oceans, we could we could face severe, severe issues in the future, especially in the terms of the fishery, of the changes in ecosystems, and it's something that could be extremely dangerous for our survival also, because we are all linked in a one world. Unlike the fishes which have operculum or the gill cover, sharks doesn't have it. They have five, mostly five, 95% of the species, even more, have five gill slits, but some of them have six or even seven. They are open, and it's one of the biggest differences that sharks have with the bony fishes. Furthermore, they have the polyphenol teeth, which are arranged in rows and series. And some species, for example, such as the tiger shark, well-known species, can change more than 35,000 teeth in their life. They are, what they're not, they're 
let's say the oldest living vertebrates because it will be the most correct way to hold them. Some of them may live up more than 400 years, such as this gremlin shark that you can see on this slide. And they reach a sexual maturity at the, about 150 years old. And while the other, other species usually reach their sexual maturity around seven, eight, 10, 50, even 30 years, which is quite a lot. Now you can imagine the extreme pressures by the uncontrolled fisheries, destructive fisheries, and uh, non-target fisheries like the long lines and the trolling boat that are catching everything they have in front of them. And you can imagine here in Vlora where we work, we had more than maybe six or 700 sharks in past 10 months. They are being caught, they are being caught uh, frequently. So what is the problem with this? If they, if they need this much time to reach sexual maturity and we are catching them every day, then a simple logic show us that in the next 10 years, we're gonna lose many species and then we're gonna lose them for good, which is something that we cannot allow to happen. And besides the late maturity, they are characterized with low fecundity, extremely slow generation time, extremely slow growth and high mortality within the neonates. They reproduce in many different ways. Some of them are viviparous, just like the mammals. They even have the placenta. Some of them lay their eggs like the cat sharks and skates. And then the embryos are developed within the egg cases and they're born through in the water. Some of them, like the stingrays, for example, you will see even later in my slide what we had here. They, they are macrotropic uh, viviparous, which means that they are drinking the milk inside the womb. And this milk that they are drinking are quite similar in composition to the mammal's milk, especially the cows. So I bet you didn't know that the finger rays actually have the milk within the womb. And what we did a couple of months ago in our labs, we tried to incubate these fetuses and try to um, give them the second chance to survive because many of these species are on the very brink of extinction, even here in Mediterranean and even globally. And look in the oceans, we can find sharks almost everywhere, from the surface until the abyss. And not only the oceans, I bet you didn't know, but there are also the freshwater species. There are sharks that could be found in freshwater, like the bull shark that can enter freshwater habitats. But there is the genus Glyphus, that is freshwater sharks at all, are similar in appearance with the bull shark. The bull shark is a very, very famous shark, so we can compare the appearances among many of them within this family. But there are also freshwater stingrays that are among the big, biggest stingrays found in the world. But how big they grow, actually? Let's compare the small, smallest and the biggest species. If you see it, the dwarf water shark is grow about 20 centimeter maximum. Contrary, the whale shark, which is the biggest fish in the, in the living fish, could reach almost 20 meters, but the average length is about 12, 11 or 12 meters. It's like a big school bus, right? And if you're gonna guess what they eat, the biggest shark is the smallest food. They feed on plankton that they filter through the water. And there are only three species, this whale shark, the megamouth shark, and the basking shark that are eating the plankton. All others are carnivores. And despite some of them would actually eat anything they find in the water. Uh, for example, what? <laughs> I bet you'll be surprised. What have we found in a shark's stomach? The drums, coats, plates, wine bottles, torpedoes. And even if you can see the night armor here was found in a shark's stomach. So it's not only interesting, but it's quite terrifying why because it means that whatever we throw in the water, something might eat and could be severely affected with it. But our work to understand the effects of pollution on disease development and individual immunological responses to pollution start beneath the waves. To work beneath the waves, you need heavily equipment. And it is something that took the most training to do, to spend time underwater to study these magnificent animals. On this slide, you can see the basic equipment that I'm taking during the night, night dives. And based on the overall safety of the divers, based on the conditions in the water, which are in the most cases extremely bad, we call it zero visibility, where we cannot see more than half meter in front of us, uh, we dive alone. So all this gear you have on yourself and you are trying to take as much as you can of information and get out and combine them with the finding that you have in the lab. And from the beginning of my talk, when I told you to imagine yourself down, this, was what, this is what I had in my mind. And this is how it looked like on me. While underwater, we try to film 
Not only the sharks, it is like a secondary or tertiary objective. What is the most important in underwater surveys is to monitor all the ecosystem, all the habitat, especially in the key habitats like our nursery grounds and growing areas, feeding grounds, which actually support us to understand all the threats and the vulnerabilities they, the, the fish have. Uh, close interactions are something that we get in very rarely. Uh, it's based for two reasons. One, sharks are unfortunately very rare to see. Unfortunately, is because we need sharks for healthy oceans, skates and rays as well. But within the close interactions, we usually do extensive health examinations of certain individuals that we found in a habitat that could possess severe threats for their survival. And even in the aquariums, we did a lot of uh, experiences for the disease development because it, these are conditions that we can control. And this knowledge could help us to save all the critically endangered populations that are the worldwide. So we utilize this knowledge and try to replicate these models into long-term conservation because saving them in their habitat is our only goal. And while diving, some of them are even playful. They are extremely curious and they skin feels like the sandpapers because of the scales they have on their bodies. And most people ask us like, oh, this is slippery, how it looks like, but the sharks are very hard. It's feel like a solid concrete covered by the sandpaper when you feel the shark, especially the big one like you see on this slide. Unlike some of them, especially like torpedo rays, for example, like you see here, are, are a bit slippery because they lack the sophisticated scales on certain parts of their bodies. And this species is very interesting because it's capable of producing the electrical shocks. And these shocks are usually ranging from 70 to 100 volts, but they can even reach 200, which is almost the whole power in your house that you have on 60 Hertz. And even with these capabilities, they still possess no threats for us. If you approach them very gently, don't touch them in a bad manner, they can allow you to do extensive examination, for example, this year is a gravid female that we examined a couple of months ago before the breeding season here. And it's, uh, they, are, they tend to accumulate in extremely shallow waters, like half meter, two meters, three meters deep. Unlike them, we also work with the deep sea species. And the deep sea species, species that could be found for more than two kilometers deep. In this depth between the upland slopes, we anticipate the most interesting, the less known and the bizarre looking sharks. And the sharks are here for a very long time. They are here far more even than the dinosaurs. It's, it's estimations that are more than 450 million years ago swimming in the oceans and rolling them. Some of them, like this deep sea seagull shark, almost haven't changed in, in, in this old time. So they far more resemble the extinct species from Triassic than the ones we see on the documentaries today. By getting to know them, their biology, reproductive biology, their morphology, their living habitats, we are, we are able to develop the special specific conservation measures that we try to apply on international scales for a macro-regional impact because uh, we believe that the success of conservation lies in not only the people changing their mind towards sharks, but in a unique measures between different countries. If the species, especially the migratory, is protected in a certain country, neighboring doesn't, you did no good because eventually due to extreme severe fishing pressures, we will end up cold. Within the labs, we cut all the tissues that shark have within the organs and we examine it under the microscopes. What we find is also terrifying. The vast majority of the samples we study suffer from certain diseases, whether it's the hepatitis, meningitis, encephalitis, or diseases in the kidneys, in the heart and different organs. More than 99%, more than 99.9% .9 of these, these uh, lesions that we observe in the pathological examinations could be linked with anthropogenic pressures, especially extensive pollution and habitat loss in the coastal areas. It is something that drove, that, that empower us to uh, develop plans that we are currently negotiating with certain governments, especially with the EU and other countries here in the Mediterranean, to mitigate these effects, because unless mitigated, they could wipe out certain populations, which is the case for this critically endangered stingray that is one of the most recent species in the Mediterranean Sea. In the entire Adriatic, it hasn't been recorded in more than three decades. And our findings from this year are the first ever findings in this area. So what we try to do, besides community 
base conservation, education, capacity building, advocacy, policy making, science, science, public science publishing, because we published over 70 papers based and two books based on our discoveries. We also try to give them a second chance they deserve. Every time we are at the vessels or at the ports, when we palpate the gravid females, we, do, we force uh, the partition surgically. And then we remove the fetuses and try to incubate them within our highly improvised labs. Either to understand better about their reproduction potential or to really give them a second chance. And unfortunately, we are not able to save everything, but we give our best to use this utility and knowledge to develop strategies that could produce extremely good results if are applied carefully. Not only histology is the main part of our work. Like the humans, they possess many, many different threats in their health. So we do also the digital radiological examinations and we do also the CT scans to understand better their functional anatomy, which is necessary to know the diseases they are that they have. All this knowledge is something new in the world. There's only a few teams that have studied the effects of pollution upon the disease, disease development. And all of us are still pioneers. And this knowledge that we have is still not enough to reach our ultimate goal. It's, we are still far from reaching it. But the time, time is running for us. Because even as we speak now, in this last maybe 10 or 15 minutes, the couple of trucks of plastics are building up into the oceans and the boats are still fishing all over the world while they speak here. And while we are discovering, publishing, fighting between each other, whatever we do, we are irreparably damaging our ecosystems, which are the only home that we have here. I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to point to the activity code on my last slide, also certain information that you can reach in touch with any other additional questions, and I would like to open this short Q&A session because I would be very happy to hear from you and to answer the questions you might have. Thank you. So I'll give one moment or two for people to get the challenge code, and I will open, I'm share my screen with, uh, with one slide here. Uh, for for the questions. No problem. Just do All right. No problems. Give one minute, and then I'll stop sharing. Yeah, Andre. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I think everyone got the chance to take the code, so I'm sharing here the screen, and you oh, can. Sorry. And you can uh, you can go to slido.com and put the code shark or use the QR code here. And we'll select a few questions for Andre to, to address. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, I'll start from the top, of course. Uh, for the first time and for the first couple of times, it's extremely scary. Uh, not only because it's the animal that is that could be far bigger than you, it's scary because you're underwater, you are breathing the gases under pressure, and it's uh, dangerous by itself. So you know, there are many ways that you, there are many things that you have to keep in your mind uh, and to consider the zero stress for the animal or for yourself. So it's quite scary. And all of us are afraid of diving, even myself, all my colleagues. So it's not like that we are running like crazies in the water. Of course, we are super excited, but we are afraid. And being afraid is something good. But we should, we should control our fear because, yes, as the second question say here, they can not only feel the fear, but they can feel the nerves pumping into our nervous system. And they can feel how we react to certain situations. So, not only the sharks, but many of animals can. So being in the calm is one of the most important things for working on the boat. Even if you don't see any big animals, anything that possess some kind of danger, you have to stay extremely calm 
And only the comments could help you to do the work the best you can. And I didn't mention my presentations, but uh, out of maybe 500 shark species that they are, only 20 have been identified in attacks on the people. And only three are responsible for more than 20 digits of attacks. So it's like the only less protegers of sharks could be possibly uh, dangerous for humans. And more than 60% of the sharks are less than one meter in total length. So the vast majority is not dangerous at all. Uh, has a shark injured you before? Yeah. Uh, happened to me a lot of times, but happened to me on dead sharks because I was working very rushly and I got injured in my arms or the teeth or everything. So when we work in the labs, I'm the guy who bleeds first probably because I do it very fast. I'm always super excited. But underwater, we haven't had any significant situation that could be described as potentially dangerous. Only once in, in a couple of years ago, maybe five, in one aquarium that we were working with, with, with the sand tigers that was that they came from the wild uh, habitat in, uh, I think, around uh, South America. And they transported them in, in Turkey and while wild, not, not captive breed. And then they started to behave quite aggressively towards us. Then we were forced to leave because something bad happens, but nothing actually happened. Uh, so how you determine if a shark is treated or not? It's first most important that you know the species that you are working with. So if you know that species is not dangerous, then it's quite uh, only concerned is day day stress, not yours. If you are if you are working with uh, a species that could be potentially dangerous, it's also difficult because it is like uh, they are like like humans, like like the mammals. They have their own personalities, the characters. So with each different individual is different. Uh, you have to use a very good knowledge in certain biological disciplines to try to understand the move, movement patterns, the uh, swimming patterns, the fins, head positions, are they bull towards you, how fast, what kind of circles they are made, et cetera. So you can maybe predict, are they threatened because it is you who enter the water and it is you who enter their home. You are, don't know what they are doing in the moment. Maybe are, they are not expecting the guests. So. It is something that you have. You need to have constantly in your mind that you are entering somebody else's territory, and uh, in order to to have the situation the best possible result, you have to consider that usually this animal usually is far more afraid of you than you are afraid of them. And uh, if it's visibility very bad, for example, as I told you, a couple of meters or even less than a meter, you cannot see, you cannot feel nothing in front of you. But animals could feel you with the electroreceptors; they can feel you from a large distances, and they know you are here. So you can, uh, you don't, the worst thing is to underestimate the animal and you should give the respect needed. You should not force anything. Uh, despite in some documentaries could be, could look very cool, uh, very easy. Uh, people who didn't, didn't have the extensive trainings should never try to do anything with wildlife. Even with the most basic one we could, because could harm both themselves and the wildlife. Something to take care about. For Megalodon, you can see it here in my camera, that couple of toots uh, is a species that could, that even uh, reproduced here in the Balkans. So the fossils are not, not common, but are rare, but existable. And we did some comparative analysis between extinct and, uh, and the recent species, but in order to understand how they change toward different times, squares, and the events. Um, my first experience was, I don't know now, maybe Oh gosh, almost 20 years ago, uh, was when I saw the cat sharks. They was uh, discarded by the, some drift net in the in the Croatia, and that was my first experience. They they were like three meters deep, dead, and I wanted to catch them, but I was extremely afraid to dive three meters deep. It was something that I thought I will never be able to do. So when I was a kid, it was quite difficult for me to to do a lot of things. But um, here I am now. Thanks God. And it's like uh, this experience. Uh, was something that cut off in my brain and uh, let me for think for a long time. And so just like maybe two years after that encounter, I started my first volunteer experiences and, and I started my career at all. So if, if shark species go extinct, uh, they are altering the food maps. They are shaping the marine ecosystems because they are uh, in the middle and upper up to the top of the predation chain. So they alter the food webs, they shape the ecosystems. If they go extinct, the most likely scenario is that marine ecosystems could dramatically change in the, even in unrecognizable shapes. So certain species like maybe jellyfishes or others could start ruling and 
could uh, possess severe threats to the fishery, for example, that, that feed 85, I think 85% of the part of the planet, even, even more maybe. So yeah, could, could be severe. I think we are, all of us are quite afraid to think what will happen, but unfortunately we are still losing the species during the during the fight to save them. We are still losing them. And this, this as it, what I see in my, in my work is I do believe there is still hope. I do believe, but a lot of evidence is quite different and, different. and there are quite a lot of stuff that even you can do to help us in conservation, to help us to mitigate the pollution, the water usage, meat consumption, anything could extremely positively reflect even on the shark because it's the nature, it's everything connected. They are, they are, the fields in the science are man-made and the nature is, is all connected. Uh, we do it like on a daily basis. We do it on a daily basis because uh, of it, what we do is uh, we call an op opportunistic research. It's combined at, at the fields. In, it's combined of mostly of fishery surveys. And we don't want to kill nor harm any animals for the purpose of our studies. So we lay in on the bycatch or the target catch within the fisheries. If we are not able to help them, to review them, to to uh, to put them in the water, or to give them second chance to the rehabilitation, then we sample them. If they are already dead, we sample them for these examinations. So it's something that we do on a daily basis, and especially for the rare species, the old samples, the old data we can get for is the good data because the science science is the, is the giving the fundamentals for conservation without assessing the current states, without knowing knowing their their vulnerabilities, they they threats we cannot develop effective conservation measures. So uh, every time we have sample, we're working. There's no work time, there's no nothing. We do it 24 seven. We stay until five in the morning, we stay in the labs. We receive calls in 10 a.m. sometimes, 10 p.m. sometimes, you never know. But there's a lot, around 500 species today that, 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 are, that lives and I think either dead or alive, I believe I saw around 50, maybe 60 species so far. There's about 1,100 1, species of sharks, skates, and rays, of which is 500 sharks. Walt, uh, I received this question on millions of interviews, and I always uh, answer it a little bit different. Um, it was something that was with me since childhood, and I was afraid to start it because I thought it is impossible to achieve. I was living uh, far from the coast. I moved a lot of times. I grew up in the in the war in the former Yugoslavia, in the poverty, and it was quite difficult in this time. Uh, we didn't have internet, and didn't have access to many results that you guys have now, so use it wisely. But this interest and the fate I had was driving me, and I used to work in the forestry, cutting trees, chopping anything that could give me money to pay the internet and to search for options online. Then I got positions and volunteer and certain certain NGOs in, in England that gave me the wind in my back. It's happened 17 years ago, 17, yeah. And uh, this was the beginning of everything. Afterwards, we just, we never stopped. Despite all the, all the difficulties we have, we still have the same difficulties we are facing even now with all the positions you saw at the beginning of my presentation. But what I consider the best even for you guys is just don't not, not to give up and not let the, not let the world ruin your dreams and your passion about something. Yeah, yeah, during the COVID was a little bit different, different because we did only local, local fields. It was difficult for us to travel and they cut it. Almost all the projects, fundings got dried and everything, but yes, we still did it. We never stopped it, even for the pandemics and before, and now we spend all the time at the fields and in the labs. Uh, I think one of them was in, 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 in a, between Greece and Turkey, the other one was in Croatia. We was diving at, at deep walls that are, fall, that are falling until the almost uppermost slopes from like the wall started uh, 10 meters and then falling vertically until maybe 200. And you are going out of the wall and it's one of the best experiences you can, you can have. Whether you dive until 40, 80, whatever, how many deep, it's it's amazing experience. Other was the the deep dive that we, we we wanted to do in Asian, but I think the, the one of our friends got got narcosis on, on maybe 40, 50 meters, then we should back and we try to do almost 100, but he stopped us this time. And we never did it before, but we, we don't do, we usually don't know, doesn't do the deep dives because the deep dives are expensive and are extremely dangerous because you need to, 
you need to go very slowly, you need to do the stops for decompression, etc. So what we aim to do is we aim to spend far more time on the shallower paces and to send ROVs, the submarines, on the deeper parts. That's how we try to combine the best way because to, to go on, on 80 meters and spend there 10 minutes is not important for the research. Um, well, most of the sharks live, you can say, from, from, from like 20 to 300 meters because of this, this is area, especially in the satellite area, until 200 until the, until the uppermost slopes where the massive productivity produ from the measures of curing. So this is the, the reefs, the shallow reefs, and the reefs are the richest areas for biodiversity and everything. But uh, for example, this guy that you can see under my back, is one of the deepest living sharks. And it's the rogue shark. So the, these, these sharks in the, in the deep areas are quite different than, than the sharks that you are seeing. And they are, uh, let's say, my interest in mostly in this deep sea species because are, I like aliens and are less known and extremely rare and we are trying to understand them and help them to survive because before it's too late. No, that's a good question. It's a very good question. Uh, yeah, uh, the baby sharks, the neonates are extremely vulnerable and uh, some of them are even very small, like 10 centimeters. And almost all the animals in the water can attack them, can kill them, can feed on them. That's, uh, we, we call it high mortality late, uh, rate within the neonates. And it's one of the biggest issues the sharks are facing. Even the, the sandbar sharks, for example, that are one of the common species, have the, have the babies very small. Like you can see this one here. They, they grow very small. This one is maybe six months old. So all the bigger fish can attack her. Even the bigger octopus can attack her. So, they are small when they are babies. They are, of course, the, their skills are very bad. They are easy caught even in the fishing equipment. And they are predated by many different species. So yes, they are extremely vulnerable in this stage. Oh, it was visited in more than 75 countries so far, maybe a little bit less. But currently, we are stationed in, in Albania, in southern Albania, in one of the in meeting point between Union and Adriatic Sea, which is the nursery ground for many different species. So we focused our effort and work currently here. But uh, sharks are found everywhere in, in, old, in old oceans, in old areas, especially, especially except the coldest ones. So pretty much wherever you can find the sea, you can find the sharks in it. And the sharks are indicated of the healthy sea, not the dangerous sea. Well, I do like all of them. Uh, I like the cat sharks and the smooth hounds because they help me to build my career. I like the hammerheads because they're super funny. And I like these deep sea sharks, all of them, because for me, it feels like exploring, exploring the, the universe, not, not the earth. And these are the species I like, like the most. Uh, Yes, we, we actually study, uh, we focus on sharks, but of course, it's like 95% of our studies is conducted on sharks, but we also studied many different, both marine vertebrates and invertebrates. We, we also studied the uh, humans and the human pathology as well. So, so we use our knowledge and skills in many different uh, areas in the fields, but the like sharks are the main focus of our work. And even if, if sometimes when we want to do something else, we are a small team and, uh, you always, in science, you always lack people, resources, money, funding, and everything. So you, are, you don't have space to work on something else, despite we, we would like to help everything that we can. But even being folks of sharks, we cannot do all the job we have. We have a few more questions. Should we take a few more, uh, Andre? Yeah, of course, of course, no problems. I'm happy to answer. <laughs> it's a good one. I usually uh, have a slide about it, but I didn't put it right now. Uh, yeah, uh, they. It's uh, before understanding does animals sleep. We have to define what a sleep is. For us, the humans, or for the vast majority of mammals, is asleep and you go and you fall asleep in a certain state that you wake up from it. 
but uh, if you define the sleep as a period for the remediation and the resting of your nervous system, especially the brain, yeah, sure does it. So it's basically most the easiest way, despite being uh, physiologically extremely complicated. Uh, you could you could imagine you can make the two two holes under the head. So one sphere of the brain, for example, is at let's say sleep or resting phase, while another one is awake. And then how the sharks could switch between these phases? It's really basic itself. Physiolo physiologically, is far more complicated. But they have these uh, periods for one part that go to resting, another one is working. But actually, in their lifetime, they are awake all the time. They are awake and they are aware. Some of them even have to move all the time because the musculature here are not enough to develop flow for the gills and to breathe. Some of them, of course, can stay. This is a, a little species who have to swim all, all the life to breathe. But yes, they have these, uh, let's say, sleeps because they have to rest their nervous system as well. Uh, they, eat. Uh, they eat quite often. And they even, uh, what is more interesting, because they even, um, uh, they can calculate if they are chasing the fish, they can calculate, is it, is it uh, going to lose more energy than they will get by digesting the fish? So they have some very interesting uh, the social behaviors between them and very interesting uh, because the shark brain is, is massive, unlike previously thought is massive. And the ratio between the body weight and brain weight is similar and even bigger than in dogs, for example. So they are quite intelligent. This, the new neurological studies in the past 15 years pointed all these conclusions. So uh, based on, the, on this, they require also a lot of energy to boost. So yes, they eat quite often. Uh, certain species like the cat shark do lay eggs, uh, but mass majority uh, give birth to live young. Some of them have the, have the placenta. As I told in my presentation, some of them are even have the, the milk in their uterus that produce to feed the fetuses before they are birth. So there are a couple of different ways of reproduction they have, but it ultimately most of them give birth to live young, but some of them even lay eggs. Because there are many different species that are quite different between each other. So if you observe all the shark species, it's they are similar to you because they are living in the sea, but uh, globally, it's like you observe the dog, dolphin, giraffe, elephant, uh, and chimpanzee. So there are always different orders between the classes of mammalia and see the sharks in a different orders between their classes. So, so based on their characteristics, they are quite far away from each other. So. The lantern sharks, especially the dwarf lantern shark, that was on, on my beginning of my presentation, is one of the. This is the smallest species that can grow up maximum, maximally I don't know about twenty five centimeters. It's like the maximum total length, but they even can grow smaller, like the fifteen centimeters adult. Even even thirteen centimeters could be the total length of an adult. The lantern sharks uh, also glow in the dark. They are they are capable of producing the bioluminescence, the blue cold light from them, and they are the smallest living shark species today. They are semi cute, extremely small and black, like your pants. Yeah, of course they had a per they have the perfect eyesight, and uh, some some species could even focus both uh, on the surface and underwater. Like when we go underwater, the dioptry is minus thirty about. But for them, some of them can focus with their muscles even between the surface and the, and the water. And their eyesight is pretty amazing. And not only be, be, they can see very well, but some of them in their head have certain cells that could detect the changes of the, of the day and night. So yes, they of course know in the deep water species that, could, that cannot control the effect of the light it's getting in their eyes. Uh, have the vertical migrations only in the night because in the night there is not a lot of light for them because they have problems with a lot of light. So yes, they of course know. And they know that they, they can feel the gravity of the earth. They know the, their positions. They're, they are quite, they are equipped with the things that we have to build for each other by, they are, they are born with it. So yes, they, they are aware of, about many things in the nature. No, it's absolutely not true. It's uh, a lot of species flip their bodies for feeding. Uh, it's something else uh, that sharks, uh, so some species could go into tonic uh, immobility that, that paralyzes, the tonic paralyzes. When it's flipped upside down, when you put your arms on their noses, you block the electro receptors and then they, they cannot process all because you, you have your electric, electric, like other animals and the humans also. 
And when you press the nose and you turn it upside down, the lateral line and the electroreceptors could get blocked and the shark could fall into tonic amability. Certain species can do it and it's helpful if you are doing small surgeries or if you are doing some examinations because it is uh, considered mostly as uh, the less stressful approach for them. So, but they are not dying. They can even survive without uh, the water. For example, this rock shark can survive more than two and a half days before uh, out of water. So they are quite resistant to, to most of the pressures. A common Ill illness uh, that I observed was the something like hepatitis. To be very precise, this, this, these are the mixed cell inflammatory aggregates of mononuclear cells into the liver parenchyma. But something like hepatitis is very common because liver is, uh, is very big. And besides their normal function, it's also storing the lipids inside for the buoyancy, for injury, et cetera. And it's the uh, first thing that got affected by the pollution as well. So yes, the liver disease, the kidney disease are something that we observe the more, but also brain disease were in the top three, I think. Well, it's highly dependable on the species. Some species prefer warm temperature waters, tropical waters. Some of them prefer very cool deep sea waters, the constant temperature. So it's, 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 uh, it's only dependable of the species. The temperature, the depths, the amount of light, the pressure, everything is actually dependable on the species you're observing. Because of this big diversity, it's, it's cannot, you cannot make any, any estimations for, for all the class because they're very different between each other. So Andre, let's go for the last questions uh, as we wrap up, and I think they're related. Okay. So first one, how many shark tips have you collected? And the second uh, one, the- Thousands. What's... Thousands, we have the, you cannot see in front of me. Wait, maybe I can show you If you take a look at my camera here, are many jaws that we have. Also here, the big ones and uh, Upper there, yeah, we have a lot of parts in our collection. And yes, for the second question, there was the real, that's what I showed you. Both of them are uh, real and are not processed their realities. And the small ones. The biggest one I saw was around 30 centimeters. These are quite small ones, but are real. From These are not from the from this nursery that was here in Balkans. These, these ones I have are from US, but I took them to have in my collection because we, uh, my girlfriend and I also, we produce these taxidermies as well because we use them for educations and for many different purposes to, uh, with our students, uh, with our master candidates, with the fishermen to teach them about how to recognize, how to enhance the post real survival. So yes, we have a quite big collection of the teeth, jaws and taxidermies. And even the species that we put in the freezers for next studies are very important in science to have. Okay, I think that was it. Uh, there were a few questions asking for to share the code again. Do you think you can put on the screen once again, Andre, before we close? Yeah, no problems. Because I'm also running out of time, but see if you can do it. I can see it. Yes, I'll get the code here and show on the screen. Uh, just okay, okay, no problems. I'm waiting. No problems. Yes, so I'm sharing the code on the screen for everyone. 
So, so in case anybody, yeah, in case anybody missed something or was too shy to ask, uh, there was my contact information at the end. You can send in some of my team and I will be happy to also give you more heads up about uh, career development, about uh, any advices that you might need and any help, any questions that you might have, we'll be happy to answer you and to support whatever we can. So thank you everyone for joining and thank you Andre for, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, it was my pleasure. Thank you guys and thank you for your attention and this wonderful questions. I love this Q&A, one of the best sessions I ever had.